questions? I would like for you to go over the biodynamic preps, if you don't mind. Okay. And just like, not so much in how we make them, but what the purpose is. Yeah, the biodynamic method is, comes from this book right here. Has anybody read this book? It's called Agriculture. Rudolf Steiner was one of the first people to get a college PhD degree in biochemistry. Now, he was on the cutting edge of learning about the, the chemistry of life. And uh, he had a lot of other uh, irons in the fire, but he was asked to give a discussion and a course about agriculture. And so this course was given in 1924. And this is about 10 years after the first synthesis of nitrogen and the beginning of the artificial fertilizer military industrial uh, type of agriculture that uh, was going on. So in this book, he gives ideas and methods for how to farm without those chemicals. And the uh, lectures themselves were not made public for 20 or 30 years. They were just given to a group of 60 people. 30 of them were scientists and 30 of them were farmers. And they were told to try this out before you start blabbing about it. <laughs> and so they did lots of experiments and came to, to figure out exactly what Steiner was talking about. So uh, he goes through the first uh, lecture and says, first of all, nobody should be talking about farming that doesn't know how to grow beets and potatoes and corn. <laughs> it has to be the people that are doing it. And that it's really important to consider that humans have emancipated themselves from the rhythms of nature. Now we may have a menstrual cycle that mimics the moon cycle, but it, all women don't start at the same time at the full moon, or it doesn't work that way. We've emancipated ourselves, so we still have these cycles in us. We have a seven-day flu, or things of this nature, but we're not tied directly to the cosmos. Animals are a little less emancipated. They, lower animals in particular, in particular, will only breed at a certain time. Yeah, and so they're more enmeshed. But the plant world is totally enmeshed in nature and the cosmos. And you can't plant corn in December. <laughs> you have to wait till May. <laughs> yeah, and so the plants are highly affected by uh, the environment. And so that he thought was really important. And uh, we have then uh, the first element that he mentions is silica. And silica is a combination of silicon and oxygen. And half of the Earth's crust is silica. And these are those crystals that you like so much. Yeah. <laughs> and so this quartz, then, is half of the Earth. And it plays a huge role, obviously, in what goes on in the Earth. And the silica is what we were talking about earlier, coating the fungal hi-fi and the tubes, and it's this connector. It's the intelligence that, that helps to get, make everything work right. And so uh, we want to do everything we can to promote the uh, ability of silica to do its, its role. And then the next element that he brings up is calcium. And he says this is the polar opposite of silica. So with silica, you have something that's not even soluble in water. It's hard, pointed, and with calcium, you have extremely soluble substance, never found alone in nature, whereas silica is oftentimes just sand it's found by itself. And calcium is always with something else. If you put pure calcium out, it immediately will oxide, it'll become calcium oxide. 
from the moisture in the air. If you calcium nitrate or calcium phosphate or you know, calcium's always joined up with something. It's real greedy. It sucks things. You can get this feeling for uh, silica and calcium if you simply hold a piece of silica. No, I don't I used to have a piece of chalk in here. But just to, you know how if you hold a piece of chalk, you can feel that sucking. It's like it dries your, your hand out. Yeah, so th that's the calcium. And then the silica is just, it's just hard rock. So they feel differently. They have different roles to play. The calcium works with growth and reproduction. And it works with the etheric elements of the earth and the water. The, the, the life that helps things to grow and reproduce. Silica, on the other hand, works more with the atmosphere and the light to help the plant to ripen and become more nutritious. And so these are two definitely different poles, and then clay is what mediates between these two things. And so the second lecture then deals with the idea that the farm organism should be an individuality and that whatever is needed for agricultural production should come from within the farm's borders. And this goes back to this idea of the self-sufficient diversified farm so that all of the feeds grown for the animals come from the farm. All the food that the people that live on the farm eat should come from the farm. And when you have a closed system like this, what happens is, is that the enzymes and hormones and auxins and all of the things that are on that farm then start working together with the humans and the humans become very much more attuned to what's going on and the animals because they're eating the foods from the farm become very much you know more attuned to the farm and it sort of builds on itself and it makes for the ability of the farm to grow more than the farm can actually use in which case, that's what you can sell. But you never sell any more than what is excess above what the humans are eating and what the animals are eating. So I grow food for three reasons, three groups of people. First and foremost, for us, the food is grown so that we can make it through another year. And if there's only enough food for, the, for us, then that's what we're going to do. Next, I grow it for my friends and neighbors and all the helpers that come to the farm. And then third, we grow it for the customers. So the customers don't get food until everybody else is happy. Yeah. So it's really important for us that our food comes from the farm. That we can and freeze and dry all of our food. And we look upon growing to the grocery store as something you do just for treats. You know, ice cream, beer, things like that. But the food should come from within the farm. And so uh, to do this, then, we have to have all those different kinds of things. You know, you have your pastures and your animals, and you have your forests with those animals, and different kinds of gardens, and everything's real diversified. Yeah. And so the uh, uh, third lecture, then, uh, is a... a, a lecture on chemistry, and he talks about nitrogen and her four sisters, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And he is trying to describe how nitrogen then, the limiting factor in, in agriculture and all chemical reactions, how nitrogen then can be properly managed on a farm. And so, again, we're not going to want to bring in nitrogen by bringing in feed for our animals or manures or bags of nitrogen. We want to somehow get the nitrogen that's from the atmosphere above our soils and we get that into our soils and into our crops. So the first thing we look at then is uh, sulfur. And sulfur is the element that the spirit uses to moisten its fingers with so that it can incarnate. So sulfur is used in very small amounts, but it has to be present 
for a lot of these biochemical reactions to happen. It's like the butter or the grease on your fingers when you're making taffy or something. You know, it's the, the, it's the grease in the, uh, the situation. So sulfur is what uh, helps, is there in minute quantities to make all this stuff work. It was known in, uh, as a light bearer and uh, smells a little bit like Lucifer. So you have uh, then carbon, which is the carrier of the spirit. So carbon is the carrier of the spirit that's trying to incarnate into plant life or animal life. Carbon is the form. It's the sculptor. It's what gives everything its, uh, its body and its form. It's the... We, you might have heard the term, we're a carbon-based life form. So anything that's alive or was alive has carbon. It's everything from graphite and coal to a diamond. And it's the framework for life. And then you have oxygen, which anything that is alive has to have oxygen. It's the giver of life. And so you have oxygen then in uh, the breathing process. So uh, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out in carbon dioxide, the plants breathe in the carbon dioxide, and they breathe out oxygen. So these things work uh, very well together. The next one we have is nitrogen. And he's looking at somehow we have got to get the oxygen to the carbon. And to unite those two, that's nitrogen's role. It's the mediator between the physical and life. Nitrogen is in the air and is 78% of the atmosphere. And nitrogen is uh, um, sensitive to what's going on in the farm. And so when we meditate and we get real still, we're holding carbon within ourselves. And consequently, we become aware of the nitrogen. And you can do this just by being quiet. And you can sort of sense this nitrogen and it connects, it's connecting us all. We're all interconnected now through this nitrogen. It's very sensitive, and it's, uh, it knows what's going on in the farm, and uh, we become uh, aware of nitrogen when we quiet ourselves down. Nitrogen is related to the air, whereas oxygen would be more like related to water, and you would have uh, carbon related more like to earth. And then the last sister to talk about would be hydrogen. We've already talked a little bit about that. And hydrogen is what helps things on Earth to excarnate fire. So this is where things go back out to the farthest reaches of the universe. And so this is a, a, a way of looking at how things incarnate from an invisible spiritual world. And they come through carbon with its unified by nitrogen with oxygen, bringing those two together, and then you have this hydrogen. And so this is a, sort of a discussion then about how these elements then work. And so uh, then in the next lecture, he gives some practical measures on how to get this working on our farms. And he implies that it was working on farms before you started using all these chemicals. And he points back to the way people's parents grew stuff and had farms, that each farm had compost and animals and legumes and rotated their crops. And, and we had a pretty good way of doing this. Now, he's talking about a farm. Uh, he's, they're having this lecture on a farm, and it's in uh, uh, what's now, I believe, Poland. And it was a place where... Uh, Eastern uh, Europe and Western Europe were kind of joining and meeting. And it was this uh, sort of uh, context of this Eastern uh, sort of spiritual thought and the Western 
spiritual thoughts. And they, they meet together here, and he gives this talk then about how uh, these, these uh, forces can be of calcium and growth and reproduction can be enhanced if we look at nature at what's the best fertilizer in nature would be the manure from a cow. And why is that? Well, it's because a cow has 100 feet of intestines and four stomachs. And a cow eats grass, it stays in the cow's belly for 18 days and gets totally transformed. And it comes out looking like pudding. And it's what plants like to, to, to have when mixed in soil, they grow the best. And this is something that these people knew from practical experience. It wasn't a theoretical thing. This is just the way it is. And so he wonders why the cow manure is so extremely valuable and so full of flora and fauna that are so beneficial for plant growth. And why a cow can live off of two acres of grass but make four acres fertile. It's, it's really a magical animal. And so all civilizations depended on cattle. And cattle in the broader term would include sheep and goats and uh, reindeer and wildebeests and all kinds of different animals, depending on what part of the world you were from. And these were those parts of those uh, three times as many ruminants who were on the planet uh, 50 years before these lectures were given. And so... The, uh, the fact that these animals have hooves and horns uh, intrigued him, and he thought that, that there was something going on where the forces that generally leave animals got caught in these hooves and horns and rayed back into the belly of the animal and made the manure so special. Because these were the animals, they're not like uh, <clears throat> other animals that don't have this. So uh, he suggests that we take some manure and that we put it into a cow horn in the fall, and then it undergoes a transformation. We dig it up in the spring, and we stir it up in some water and sprinkle it on our fields. And so this is a, a, a preparation that I'll show you. And you'll notice that this is colloidal. It, it like you can squeeze it, and it kind of bounces back, and so, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it doesn't smell like manure anymore. Now, when I first heard all this stuff, I thought this is the biggest bunch of bunk I've ever heard. And so I was like, you know, and they said, well, Jeff, you don't have to believe it for its work. It doesn't require your belief or your faith or intentions or anything like that. It's just if you use this, your soils will have more humus in them. So I tried it. I liked it. it seemed like it worked. It's hard for me to explain why. So this was 35 years ago. So uh, we're uh, in about a year. I decided, well, I'm just going to take some of that manure and put it into a goat horn, and then I put some into a pint jar and buried it right next to the cow horn. Well, those didn't change at all. They came out and they were like anaerobic, stinky manure. Where only in the cow horn did it change into a humus-like substance. So, uh, so we uh, do this, and it helps to uh, it makes the soils have humus. If uh, in the uh, front of the book, the, the, the scientist says, "Well, when we take manure in the laboratory and look at it, and we take what's been in the horn into the laboratory and look at it, the one from the horn has is full of enzymes and hormones and auxins." Now, what are these things? Well, we don't know what these things are. You know, enzymes, I always can't help but think of that little TV ad where the, the little enzyme was eating the dirt on the laundry, from the laundry detergent. <laughs> that was an old TV show. You're giving your age. <laughs> yeah, and uh, hormones, they make us act funny some of the times. Auxins are involved in plant growth. These are all kind of imponderable, invisible things. We know they exist, but uh, we don't maybe realize how extremely important they are. So it's likely that these really small things are very key to keeping everything healthy and running smoothly. 
And so this is an effort to have more of these enzymes in our soil. This horn manure is a good, a good way to do that. So then he says that we have to balance this uh, calcium growth reproduction uh, preparation with one that helps the other side of life, which is death. And so we want to have something that helps to ripen the fruits and have them store well so that they can be planted next year and be used for nutrition for higher animals. So if you look at a, and this is one of his meditation practices, you look at a, a kernel of corn and just look at it for a long time and think about it, you'll, you'll realize that if I had something that was made in a laboratory that cost a million dollars and looked it like that corn and tasted like it and you know, we could do that, but we could never make something that would sprout and make a corn plant. We don't know how to do that. Yeah, so there's something in that corn kernel that he called a life force, the ability to make life. And so that corn seed then has two distinct directions that it can go. The corn could be planted to make a corn plant, or it could rot in the soil and help another plant grow. But on the other hand, it can be eaten by a higher kingdom of nature, an animal or a human. And that's a stream of nutrition. And so one is a stream of growth, and the other one is a stream of nutrition. And the stream of nutrition is guided by silica. And this is where we would take the quartz crystals and we grind them into a powder and put them in a cow horn in the summer months, and then we stir this product up in water and sprinkle it on the plants during the summer, not to help make humus, but to actually help slow down the growth processes so that the ripening and uh, nutritional qualities are enhanced. And this would be a major difference between the biodynamic and the organic method in that uh, in organics we do a lot of things to make humus and make things grow better but we don't ever try to do something to stop that growth and make it more uh, nutritious. So this is a, a silica preparation. Yeah, and so then he ends this lecture four by saying, mind you, <laughs> these preparations are not made to replace previous agricultural practices. They're merely an enhancement. You must go on manuring as before and by that he meant fertilizing. And so that line then really stuck with me, and that's why I study farming books from pre-1914. I want to know how they fertilized and how they ran their farms, because we had a pretty good thing going there. We had taken European methods of agriculture and brought them to this new country and found corn, potatoes, beans, and squash. None of those have been in Europe. All new plants. And the, we learned how to use those plants and make for uh, an agriculture based on them. So that's what we have here. And then, uh, but we also had the ability to use some of the old world crops and the ideas of crop rotations making composts and things of that nature. So it was kind of a blending of two cultures. And so this agriculture that was happening in the late 1800s was pretty darn good. And the farms uh, were very diversified. I would recommend Louis uh, Brumfield's book, The Farm. And it talks about his grandfather's farm and all of the food that they were growing there. And then another book by him is Malabar Farm, which is his own effort to recreate that and uh, what, how he did this back in the 40s. Yeah. He was a famous uh, writer at the time who decided to move back to a farm. <coughs> kind of interesting. Uh, so other uh, books that came along would be The Agricultural Testament by Sir Albert Howard in 1940, and which thanked Rudolf Steiner for his, his preparatory work here. And then... Uh, we have all of Rodale's works, and you know, over the course of the years, we have a lot of good organic 
farming books out there. But it's really fun to go back to the before World War I and see what they were saying back then. And I have these books from like 1824, and it talks about farming in the wild wildernesses of the western United States. And you're reading this book and talking about how important it is to put calcium on these the soil, but not use too much unless you're adding an extra manure and all this interesting stuff. And then about a third of the way through the book, you realize he's talking about 20 miles west of Philadelphia. <laughs> but the idea, you know, that this, the lime is really so important, but we can actually use too much lime. And there's a saying that lime will make the farmer rich, but the sun poor. So you can't just keep using one of these many agricultural practices that, that I talk about. You can't just lime, or you can't just use compost. If you keep using compost, 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 your soils become very acidic because of all the carbon. That's what I did on my farm for 10 years. I didn't know you had to lime. No one ever told me. We didn't have to lime in the glaciated Illinois. <laughs> we had plenty of lime. Yeah, so uh, these are things I just learned slowly. Didn't you also end up with too much phosphorus? Um, I, I didn't have that problem, but many people did. Yeah. So, uh, 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 and that was a, a lot now is coming from chicken manure. There's too much phosphorus in chicken manure. But uh, no, my farm was low on phosphate, actually. So phosphate really helped us. Um, so then in uh, lecture five, the first paragraph, he says, I have to remind you that you have to go on manuring as before. So all these things that he's talking about are not meant to replace anything that would be termed good farming. We have to do the good farming. So now he's saying that we're, uh, we want to work with potassium and silica and calcium and phosphorus and uh, iron and uh, all of these things are really important, sulfur, you know, for growing plants. So how are we going to work with these? Well, he wants us to look at yarrow. And in yarrow you have a plant that has a really beautiful connection of sulfur and potassium. And he then says we should take the little yellow flower, the little white flowers of the yarrow plant, cut them off, and stuff them into the bladder of a male deer. And then we bury this, and then we make a humus product out of that that we put into the compost pile. And we just use a spoonful of this for a compost pile as big as a house, he says, which is interpreted to mean 10 to 15 tons. Yeah. So we could pass this around, maybe I won't give you quite so much. But yeah, and this is a yarrow that's been in the bladder of a stag. And this works to help the, to the plants to, uh, to grow healthy. Uh, because it's put into the compost piles, it makes the, it might have maybe things in it that help the microorganisms that were in the soil that were helping to get the unavailable potassium available that got destroyed when you used murate of potash or sulfate of potash because those things destroy the very enzymes and microbes that help to get these elements continuously flowing. So things are all the time going into life and back out of life through the incarnating of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And so potassium goes from just being in a granite rock to becoming part of a microbe, to becoming part of an earthworm, to becoming part of a plant, to becoming part of an animal or a human, and then going back again in the bones, maybe back into the soil again. So these things are continually moving into life and then back out. If all of the potassium in our soils was in, available to plants, you know, like water soluble, the first time it rained it would just leach out. It's a good plan, what we have. The plan is really good, it works well. Nature wants to keep these things in an insoluble, unavailable form until the plant needs them. And then through the interaction of all this biology, the plant can get it while it's needing it.
So next he says that we need to look for a plant that not only has the potassium and sulfur, but also has calcium, and he finds this in chamomile. And so we take the little yellow flowers from chamomile, and this time we don't put them in a bladder of a deer, male deer, we put them in an in intestines of a cow. And so here we're taking something that smells really, really nice and putting in something that smells really, really bad. <laughs> and so we make sausages. And so we make these sausages uh, out of this uh, chamomile flour. And this time we're, uh, we're trying to help stabilize the nitrogen in the compost so it doesn't fly away too much. And so you'll notice that in the, the yarrow that we have still the kind of you can sort of see the little uh, uh, yarrow florets on it, but this chamomile preparation, we can't see anything. It's just, uh, it just looks like humus or dirt or something. So this time, uh, uh, I'm gonna step back a second and say this sounds a little bit weird. <laughs> so I'm gonna remind you that if you have a bladder infection, an herbalist would point you to yarrow. And if you have a tummy ache, an herbalist might point you to chamomile. So these, there is a connection between these plants and these organs. So the next preparation is uh, used to help the plants to become, uh, the, the soil to become intelligent. And he takes a plant that is a very special plant, stinging nettle. And this plant here has uh, uh, the, uh, the, stink, the, the little hairs on it that sting you when you touch it, but it's very, very nutritious. It's probably more nutritious than anything you can grow in your garden. And it uh, makes a beautiful preparation. And uh, this time we just, we put this into clay tiles and put a screen on it and bury it surrounded by peat moss rather than an animal organ. And uh, it, uh, it then turns into this thing. We put this in the compost pile and it radiates these forces of this time it's potassium and silica and iron, it's like a iron radiations. Yeah. And so, uh, and then uh, uh, the next one is we take the. What did you say you surrounded by peat? Peat moss. Peat moss. So this one is uh, uh, oak bark. And uh, so oak bark has a lot of calcium in it. If you burn oak bark, it'll have uh, the ash will contain 77% calcium. And oak bark, uh, Steiner thought, would be valuable to help our plants resist diseases. And so uh, this time we put the oak bark, grind it up in a Corona mill, and we, uh, when I kill a cow, we cut the head off, and we take a spoon and we scoop out the brains, and we put the oak bark ground up into the skull cavity of the cow, and then we bury it in a mucky space. Most of the other preparations are buried in good soil, like good humus soil. But this time we want it to be in an anaerobic mucky place. And then this preparation, when added to the, to the compost piles, then helps the uh, plants that are grown on the soil fertilize with that compost to, to resist diseases better. So at this point, he says, now I've talked about four things, and, and you probably think that this is a lot of work. But he reminds us that this is a lot less work than going into a laboratory and synthesizing nitrogen or making potassium and phosphorus fertilizers. This is all stuff that anybody, any farmer, can do on their farm. And it allows the farmer then to have at their fingertips the phosphorus and potassium and nitrogen and all these other things that they need for plant growth. This is a really cheap way to farm. Yeah, and so uh, he suggests that, that these, there's such a thing as a transmutation of elements and that under the influence of hydrogen, the potassium then and calcium become something more like nitrogen and then they eventually become nitrogen itself. And this is the nitrogen he wants for us to grow our plants with. Because nitrogen is the sens sensitive uh, 
awareness, consciousness. So when we eat something, nitrogen is in the protein. Nitrogen is very, very important. And so where that nitrogen comes from affects our consciousness. So when we're getting our nitrogen through these kinds of inter soil interactions with the flowers and the, and the organs and stuff in the soil and all of this stuff, the nitrogen then is more in tune with the farm and we become, by eating that, then we become, our consciousness is raised. And when we get our food from synthesized nitrogen, uh, our consciousness is going to be lowered. And this is visible in day-to-day -day life. You know, you all eat your own food, right, mostly? Try to? Have you ever had to go out somewhere else and eat at a restaurant for a day or two? And you're, you just, can you feel your consciousness go down? <laughs> it's just, it's, you just don't feel as good. You don't feel as aware. Yeah, so, uh, you know, particularly valuable to, to try to live on wild foods for a while. You really become vibrant when you're getting your sustenance just right from the earth. Yeah. So uh, the, the next one is that, that uh, we're going to take the flowers from dandelion. And this is a, a preparation then that works with potassium, but not potassium and calcium. Oak would be this one right here. And then whatever you gave before, nettles, I guess. Nettles would be right here. Isn't that a fun one to hold? <laughs> Yeah, so this is dandelion flowers, and this one we put into the stomach lining of a cow, and this helps uh, when it's put in the compost and then put on the soils and we grow plants there. This helps the plants to be able to draw into them what they need from all the stuff that's in the atmosphere and just in the world, surrounding world. And so this was a, a, a sentence in this book that really had me pondering, why, how could a plant possibly get what it needs if I don't put it there. I'm still a materialist. And I was like, you know, so I was out in my corn patch. This is like 35 years ago. You know, and I'm sitting there in this corn patch kind of meditating a little bit, thinking about this, how do plants get stuff? And I thought to myself, you know, if I didn't put phosphorus and nitrogen in the form of compost or whatever on this field, how would the plant get it? And right then, a bird flew by and pooped. <laughs> and I was just struck by the interactiveness of nature and how everything is interconnected. And there's little threads of connections everywhere. And to think that, that things aren't moving around is ridiculous. There's phosphorus and bird manure and then a nitrogen, and that gets moved around. One of the stories I like to tell uh, particularly since we're talking about tillage. And so I go in a field and I sprinkle some wood ashes in the wintertime. And then I grow uh, some, uh, up some plants the next year. And I've got these plants growing. And there's a plant that's growing, it's a corn plant. And it's growing up, but it's lacking potassium. And the plant starts leaning. Potassium's important for making the stalks real strong. And so that plant is starting to lean. And if it doesn't get some potassium, it's going to fall over. So you know what? These microbes are freaking out. They're like, we've got to get some, you know, because it's their food source. So their root exudates are coming out of this corn plant. And so they're, these, they're just like freaking out. And so they, they, they send some of these fungal hyphies out. So you've got to find us some potassium. And so the fungal hyphi stretches out in the soil. And it finds that wood ash that I put there last winter, which the plant root can't access. But the fungal activity can access that potassium. And it gets caught into the fungal activity. And with the interaction of uh, calcium and other things, it's, it's the hydrogen, it brings that potassium ion back towards the plant. Uh-oh. I decide to run my cultivators over the field, trying to save my moisture. And I cut the fungal hyphae in two with the potassium ion on the wrong side. The plant starts leaning more. The microbes are freaking out. It's just it's a worrisome situation. But then an earthworm comes by and eats the fungal hyphae that has the potassium ion in it. And the earthworm starts crawling over towards the plant. And everything's looking really, really good. 
but then the earthworm has to grow up and get a breath of air. And a bird comes by and picks up the earthworm with the potassium ion and flies way over into a branch of a tree in the forest. The plant is leaning even more. But then the bird poops, and the potassium ion falls to the ground and gets caught on a mouse's leg. And the mouse starts walking towards the plant. Things are looking better. But then a snake comes and eats the mouse. Oh, my God. But then the snake goes over and sheds its skin by the plant, and the plant gets the potassium ion, and everything's fine. So that's how it works in nature, exactly like that. Everything is really interconnected and extremely complicated, and we could never really totally understand it. We just have to realize that things are going to be okay, and that as long as we as farmers don't screw up too much, if we don't overtill, we don't overfertilize, we don't overwater, we just do things naturally, we do our rotations, everything's going to be fine. So the last preparation is, is a, a valerian, it's a juice, I'm not going to pass it around. Um, and then this was the horn silica, it's just a ground up quartz. Uh, you, can, you don't really want to breathe it, <laughs> silica dust is not good for you. Where is this one that gets passed around here? Dandelion. Dandelion. And it's sewn up in the stomach lining of a cow. Yeah. And so these uh, six preparations that we just talked about are put into the compost piles, and then uh, the compost is put on the fields. Do you have equisetum? Yes, and equisetum would be the last preparation, then, and that's horsetail. And that one is a plant that's 90% of its ash would be silica. And it was recommended in the course as being something to help uh, stop fungal diseases, but it turns out that equisetum promotes fungal growth, but it promotes good fungal growth. So most of the fungal and bacterial things in the world are beneficial. There's just some that are not. And when we sterilize and do this kind of stuff, then we get rid of everything, that's when the bad ones have a chance to, to uh, proliferate. And that's why, like, after you have a round of antibiotics, you might be asked to eat some yogurt or some kimchi or something to re-inoculate your uh, gut fungi, you know. So can I interrupt there for a second? Yeah. Can you go back to talking about the candida aura that I mentioned early on? Well, that is a, a, a situation where when we we strip ourselves of fungal stuff, then we allow this empty place for something like that to come in. Right. But as long as we fill ourselves up with good stuff, we can go walk into the candida and just say, bring it on, and it's not going to hurt us because we have all of the things in our bodies that'll, that'll right. prevent that. So the upshot of that story was that they had a... The people in the hospitals were afraid to be around it. They were actually in one hospital neglecting patients because they were scared of it. Because uh -huh. there was nothing that stopped it. Right. Um, wow. And this patient died, and they had to sterilize the room. And they did a hydrogen peroxide mist for a week. And then put a Petri dish in there to see what was alive. And Candida aura was alive. It was in everything. Had they instead done a week of spraying equisetum, it would have been promoting the healthy fungal growth. That petri dish would have been covered up with life, and there would probably be nary a uh, candida aura. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so it's just that it applies everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, the solution is not to kill things. A few years ago, somebody sent me an article from the New Yorker, <clears throat> and it was talking about sandor cats and the uh, uh, good bio guts and stuff. And it had this, this thing that said this uh, guy had an earache. He's had this earache all his life. He'd go to doctor after doctor. Nobody could do anything about this ear infection. And it was, it was, it was horrible. And so finally, he just quit going to doctor. And he ended up having to go back to doctor uh, a few years later. And the doctor said, hey, what happened to that ear infection? And the guy said, I don't have any more. He said, what'd you do? He said, I stuck my finger in my good ear, went like this, and put it in my bad ear, and it went away. <laughs> You're wet. <laughs> Yeah, so we we want to have all these things, these bacteria and fungal stuff. We want they're they're good guys. Now they do get out of control sometimes, but it's usually when there's an anaerobic situation. Another reason why we have to keep our soils aerated so we don't seal them up and start developing alcohols and formaldehydes and things that stop the the, the good growth. Yeah. So after those uh, uh, 
lectures four and five, then he goes into lectures six, seven, and eight, which just for brevity are just about the interconnectedness of nature, a lot of permaculture ideas, uh, ideas about animals that they shouldn't be forced into uh, eating right next to each other, that they need to be out on the farms and the land. And, and, uh, and then he uh, uh, graciously thanks everybody for having such a great party. And he says that uh, farming is all about these festivals and about having fun and getting the uh, family members together on Sundays and stirring these things up and feasting together. And this is all extremely important in agriculture. The farm that they were on was typical of that era. It was 18,000 acres. The farm had a village. It had a baker and a blacksmith and et cetera, et cetera, and hundreds of people. And so farms are meant to be these big things that have lots of interactions going on with them, so that there's lots of stuff going on, and they work really well that way. Yeah. It's not the idea of having one guy on a big tractor doing all this stuff. Yeah. Farms are social enterprises, yeah. So that was a little talk on biodynamics. Any other questions? What in comfrey, do they use it as a root, a root toner or comfrey? I, I used it to knit bones. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not one of the preparation plants, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I, I know it's not, but yeah. I didn't know what they, I seem to use it or something. I think it's... Well, uh, comfrey is one of the plants that we use, along with stinging nettle and a few others, to make a fermented tea that we might sprinkle on our plants. So. Uh, a lot of these plants that, that have really good growth forces, you know how fast a <laughs> comfrey can grow and stuff, so, or nettle too, so we, we cut them and chop them up a little bit and put them in water and then stir that a few, every few times every day and it gets this kind of liquid that you can water your plants with that kind of gives them a perk, perk up. Now, so this, that's something that I did when I was a gardener, but as a farmer, I just don't fool with that kind of stuff. It's just too much. Yeah. How do you grind your quartz? Uh, we take a, a, you know what a post hole, uh, the thing that you put in those metal T-posts with? Mm -hmm. So we flip that upside down, that would be the uh, dandelion. Sure. Yes. Uh, and then we uh, put the, uh, hammer the crystals. Well, I sure wanted to get a hammer out with your place. Smash these crystals up. She's a crystal, uh, she has beautiful crystals. And smash them up with a hammer. And then we put them into this uh, upside down post hole tamper. And then we take uh, the, the tool that you use to put the rocks in the posts with, and it fits right in there. And then we smash them like that and just keep smashing it and then pour it through a sieve of some kind, screen it out, and whatever it doesn't do, we smash it. And then we add a little water and put it into the collar. How do you apply it to steel? It's just stirred. We use a, a, a whisk broom and a five gallon bucket and just fling it like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just like, and uh, we've wondered why Steiner had us do it that way, and uh, back in those days, there were priests and stuff that were still anointing land like that, so, you know, I, I don't know if that had something to do with it or not. But one of the things about this whole agricultural course that really pisses us off about Rudolf Steiner is that he gave this immensely interesting uh, lecture course I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in there that are just fascinating ideas. And then he promptly dies. <laughs> and we, nobody could ask him, well, why, what, what are you talking about? But he goes into great length at about how important your skin is and the boundaries and the difference between the inside of you and the outside of you. And we realized what he meant was he was talking about life always concentrates in organization. So when things are organized, Life can happen. If they're chaotic and there's no boundary, life can't happen. So everything that's alive has a skin. And it stinks on the inside and should not stink on the outside. And when it stinks on the outside, then that's a sign of ill health. And, uh, and just there's all these interesting things about raising the ground up a little bit over the other land makes that soil more uh, vibrant and full of life because of that, you know, extra oxygen and nitrogen in it. You know, the atmosphere, the soil being more in li having live nitrogen in it, whereas the air has dead nitrogen. These are all just very, very interesting concepts that we don't really, kn you know, know where he got this stuff from. Or, but it's just a, it's a great book, so I highly recommend it.
A lot of people would say that the, the biodynamic method is about planting by the moon signs. And <clears throat> Steiner in his book makes it clear that, yeah, the moon signs are extremely important in agriculture, but don't expect humans to understand it. And by the way, thank God, the moon isn't dependent on human intelligence. <laughs> so, you know, whenever we do something, there'll be the right moon sign that's going to come along sooner or later anyway. But uh, it's certainly fun to experiment with planting by the signs. And that's something that uh, here in, Ap in Appalachia they did, uh, you know, 100 years ago was very common. People didn't just go plant their garden, they checked, you know, where the, the moon was and stuff. Um, so one of the guys I work with, he kind of said something to me about um, simulating lightning around plants and stuff and how that really brings up some vitality. I know that's part of the nitrogen cycle. And I kind of thought he was, I thought it was kind of crazy when I heard it. But then um, this year when we had our first lightning storm, I saw two beavers, a white squirrel, just all this biodiversity out on the farm the very next day. Um, and I really felt like that was waking everything up. And, and it was really when, when I, um, I saw the transition from the, the winter weeds to, to more summer weeds and wow. stuff. That is interesting. Yeah, so uh, it's well known that lightning brings in nitrogen to the soil. Yeah, I remember where that Yeah, was. right, right. And another thing that does is snow. Snow has a lot of nitrogen. And so you'll find rich soils up in places that have snow cover. Mm -hmm. Shiitake farmers know that if there's a lightning strike, they'll go out and find shiitakes about yeah. a month later. <laughs> oh, so it really, yeah. Yes. Nature is just so interesting. Just amazing. So um, I would like to offer some of these biodynamic preparations. So I put all of these preparations together into something that we call barrel compost. And it's, uh, uh, specifically, it's eggshells, manure, and basalt rock that we stir for an hour. <clears throat> we put into a barrel. <clears throat> we add all these preparations to it. And then it makes this, uh, this real nice stuff. And uh, if, we could, if you'll want to, you can take some of this home, stir for 20 minutes, and sprinkle it on your gardens, and report back. <laughs> or not. <laughs>